ready, we can uh, go to live stream. I already just started live streaming. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, welcome to the uh, final thesis presentation for uh, Kate Koryataeva, uh, Body and Architecture. Um, I'd like to welcome our two guest critics, our external critics. Uh, joining us from, uh, from SciArc is uh, Jacqueline Bloom. We're very happy to have you join us. Uh, also principal of uh, JHB. Um, and our other guest is Julie Jira, who is a senior designer with Tipple Architects here in Toronto. Um, Kate's committee is Colin Ripley, uh, supervisor, Scott Sorley, second reader, and myself, uh, Marco Polo, as program rep. Um, so, Kate, we have your presentation pre recorded. So, yes. as soon as we're ready, we can run that. That, I'm assuming, will run for about 20 minutes. Is that right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. After that, we will ask, um, we will invite questions for clarification. And if there are no questions for clarification, we'll go right into the, the discussion. Um, so, whenever we're ready, we can run that. Video. Okay. This work is titled Bodies in Architecture and it will attempt to face two assumptions that underlie the Western architectural discourse in relation to the human body. First is the idea that architecture can operate exclusively addressing the physical body as its subject. Second, the lack of specificity in the post-structuralist discourse that transcends human-centric operations but asks very few questions of bodies conceived as cultural artifacts. This presentation consists of three parts. The first part, Thoughts on Bodies, focuses on physical, partial, and imaginary bodies and their relationship to space. Second part, the Design Research Experiments, explores four specific imaginary bodies, engaging with mechanisms that produce them. Last part, the Design Project, attempts to house the selected bodies in a speculative project of a home. The four selected bodies present specific case studies, however, they only speak to a small part of the universe of imaginary and projected bodies that this work argues constitute a contemporary human. Part 1. Thoughts on Bodies Ever since Vitruvius, at the foundation of Western architectural thought lies formalizable status of the surrounding world, constructed by mining ideal bodies for principles of composition, proportion, and symmetry. For example, the plan of the Giorgio Santa Maria della Grazia, on the left, reveals itself as a system of proportions based on the translation of an ideal male body, an avatar. Similarly, the man in Le Corbusier's Modulore, in the center, is an avatar based on a six-foot-tall English male body chosen over other bodies as a source of proportional harmony. John Haydock's 15th mask for his Berlin proposal, on the right, is also an avatar of masculinity that acts as a symbol. The 1990s explosion of interest in the body turned the argument of bodies producing spaces on its head, arguing that spaces can also influence and produce bodies. Reading the three drawings from a standpoint of this argument, the Giorgio's Basilica molds and constrains the physical body to the ideal proportions. Le Corbusier's Modulor formalizes an ideal body described through the system of mathematical operations, and in its symbolic operation, Haydock's mask preserves the avatar of masculinity as an ideology. In Are We Human, Beatrice Colomina and Mark Wigley explore the ways in which design spaces mold human bodies into images of normality, arguing that in its raw state, human body is malleable, undetermined, and adaptable. Just like the mass-produced sex dolls are consistently modeled after ideal bodies, the formal and symbolic operation of architecture produced with archetypal body imagery participates in the processes of reshaping the human body by ordering clean, gendered, racial, and sexual subjects. The mold shapes the silicone into the doll as much as the doll shapes the mold by proliferating desires for ideal bodies. Similarly, the work that the avatar of an ideal male body does for Di Giorgio is essential to the design of the basilica. The conversation of physical and metaphorical molds in design tends to focus on Foucault's institutions as prime examples of architecture complicit in the formation of managerial techniques concerned with sexual and economic productivity of a normative family unit. However, the modern movement reframed the mass-produced American home as yet another institution, capable of constructing normative bodies at a more intimate scale than public institutions ever could. In The Feminine Mystique, Betty Friedan interprets the American home as a reservoir complicit in the perpetuation of gendered archetypes, delineating feminine and masculine spaces and manipulating the lack of identity associated with the archetypes into monetary gain. In opposition to the idea of a complete body and its exclusionary operations, the post-structuralist discourse turned to partiality. The alternative outlooks on body reframed biological determinism by conceiving of fragmentation as a multiplicity, not necessarily related to a past or future whole. 
In Flesh, Diller and Scafidio arrive at the discussions on partiality in architecture by confronting the losing Gattari's practice of body without organs with an idea of organs without a body. They explode physical bodies of bachelors until the remaining isolated parts can hardly produce definitive inscriptions of gender or sex and apply similar principles to the plywood house as parts of the facade gain autonomy from underlying coherent ideas regulating the surface. Partiality is not a call for the erasure of familiar images. In Five Points Toward a Queer Architecture, Andrew Holder argues that the idea of a partial body aims to disorient the existing hierarchies instead of erasing them. For example, the organizational model of the Vajenko, a viral sex doll, aims to conceive of a new yet remotely familiar reality through grafting of organs relinquished as a result of the unmaking of a coherent body. As partiality gets assimilated as a legitimate design operation, its underlying mission is to put into question the conception of the human body as an archetypal figure. In relinquishing the interest in coherent bodies, the post-structuralist discourse reframed the body as a multiplicious phenomenon, reflective of complexities of our social reality. The lived experience of a body defined by its externalities calls for imagining projected bodies for different occasions, such as work, home, public and private spaces, and social media. Therefore, to reinforce the partial nature of our bodies, at no point can the full extent of a human body be described as a coherent whole. In Beyond Wearables, Lucy McRae draws a diagram delineating the ideological territory of design with a projected body layer situated between the limits of the skin and the surrounding space. This cross-section is precisely the territory this work will attempt to operate in. Part 2. The Design Research Experiments In lieu of embracing established archetypal bodies, this work will tap into indeterminate and imaginary bodies. In considering the possible anatomies of contemporary bodies, four areas of focus begin to emerge. The detected body, brought about by surveillance technologies. The social media body, a collection of online personalities. The anxious body, a symptom of anxiety as an emerging signature affliction of our age. And the sex doll body, a punctum of sexual identity. The detected body, experiments with fuzzy boundaries. The emergence of detected bodies is anticipated in postscripts on the societies of control, as Deleuze describes the transformation of Foucault's top-down governable envelopes into softer systems for managing life. To visualize the reality of autonomous urban-scale surveillance system, this work uses LiDAR, a sensor used in machine vision. The creatively productive feature of LiDAR is that algorithm that analyzes the maps has no way of assigning meaning to produced point clouds. The LiDAR mappings behave like Lacan's lamella, a shifting blob deprived of the symbolic order with breached and fuzzy boundaries, making it difficult to categorize objects and determine their histories. These imaginary environments were collaged from objects and surfaces randomly mapped across Toronto. The visual representations of bodies detected by LiDAR have no concern for their internal organization, documenting only their relationship to other bodies. The comparison of two mappings of a body among a tree forest and a forest of metal columns makes it challenging to differentiate between the natural and the human-made context, as their stripped-down corporeality complicates the categorization. This imaginary environment is an amalgamation of physical bodies, machines, concrete, plants, and technology. As the mapped objects collide into the imaginary continuum, their histories dissolve in favor of the new spatial relations, shifting focus from the clear limits of the objects to spatial relations. The social media body experiments with dispersal of authority over reality. One of the symptoms of transitioning away from Foucault's societies is a universal dispersal of authority. When social media operates freely, the resulting digital landscape becomes a territory for bodies with the capacity to plug in to craft unique realities. Projected outside of our physical bodies, our social media avatars evolve into insidious forms of being human as their alliance with ideas of indeterminacy and partiality fills them with potentials for crafting new responsive landscapes. For example, this image is a composite mapping of a work of architecture modulated on social media to reflect this collectively crafted view of the building. Hundreds of photographs gathered through the hashtags are layered based on their features. The aggregate images highlight a single point of interest in each project, discarding the rest of the building into background. 
Each experience documented by social media bodies appears similar, but is slightly different, hence the fuzziness of the mappings. To visualize this collectively produced social media landscape, the architectural objects from the mappings are extracted and multiplied. The two methods of making copies of the objects attempt to simulate the uniqueness of each social media body's experience. The top row method introduces gradual changes to the same form, while the bottom row method aims to produce simulacra of the initial object. A landscape found in an online warehouse is populated with copies of the social media mappings following the pre-programmed degree of randomness of parametric software. The resulting landscape emerges from a place of difference and a collective mode of reproductions of work of architecture as an interpretation of an assemblage of found objects, like Piranesi's imaginary landscapes constructed from his studies of Roman ruins. However, both the social media landscape and Piranesi's imaginary Rome rely on an interpreter, undermining the desire to experiment with the dispersal of authority. To remove the interpreter from the process, the mappings are fed into a landscape reconstruction software used in drone surveillance. The resulting copies of objects represent algorithms' best guesses as to what the objects may look like based on the number of images available. These objects present a version of the social media landscape collectively produced by the users, with constraints associated with singular authorship replaced as much as possible with computational processes. The anxious body desires for the aesthetic of comfort and pleasure. The mid-20th century brought to light neurological diseases such as depression, personality, and anxiety disorders as signature afflictions of our age. Harry Harlow's experiments on infant monkeys produced the first conclusive evidence of the importance of touch and contact pleasure for humans and human-like animals. His experiments demolished the dominant rhetoric of behavioral psychologists that excessive exposure to pleasure can result in the production of over-dependent and unproductive citizens. In The City of Tomorrow and its planning, Le Corbusier acknowledges the impact environments can have on mental health, conceptualizing architecture as a spatial psychological device. An example of a such device addressing anxiety is Temple Grandin's squeeze machine, shown on the left, that calms anxious cattle through deep touch sensation. The sci-fi artist Lucy McCrae combines Harlow's argument for materiality that prioritizes comfort and pleasure with Grandin's squeeze machine, shown on the right. In contrast to the mostly visual operation of contemporary architecture, the argument for addressing the anxious body is aesthetic, calling for fleshy, elastic, and fuzzy materiality that prioritizes pleasure. The sex doll body. Experiments with grafting and transplanting of parts and organs. The design processes used to manufacture off-the-rack mainstream sex dolls recall the modernist affinity for ideal bodies, producing gendered sexual and racial silicone dolls. However, an emerging alternative mode of designing editable dolls that are more responsive to real desires and fantasies transcend constructed ideal images and disturb the mainstream market. Brought about by proliferation of privacy and customization, the alternative sex doll bodies can be assembled from decorporealized organs that imitate beings from dolphins to video game characters. In this newly established design framework, no material is off limits and no thing ends up being excluded from the catalog of parts. In their mutually defining relationship, Elizabeth Grosh describes the processes that produce bodies and spaces as simulations. The body of a sex doll assembled from accidental parts can be thrown into the simulation to transform the pre-existing reality into the image of the doll. Conceiving of familiar domestic spaces as a collection of bodies ready to be exploded into a pool of organs and regrafted into new bodies, the experiment with the generic closet attempts to reorganize the initially recognizable space into new and remotely familiar image, responsive to needs and wants of the sex doll. Similarly, the generic garage, an archetypal space for masculine operations, is reorganized and intensified to become less concerned with definitive categorizations and more with the performative nature of the doll as a conductor of pleasure. Domesticities are further assembled into a new monstrous unity. The transformed and intensified closet and body shop are attached to a bedroom, forming a novel programmatic spatial condition concerned with showcasing body modifications and fulfilling sexual desires. The experiments with home as a collection of spaces to be reassembled into new sex doll bodies aims to address the preconceived notion of home as a coherent construct that produces coherent bodies. 
space that embraces the sex doll model and allows for body modifications and replication is in violation of legitimate modes of natural production and reproduction of bodies, and hence operates illegitimately. Part 3. The Design Project The starting point is the recognition of the indeterminate and partial nature of bodies that will be housed in the home. As the physical body is discarded, the programmatic and aesthetic focus of the home shifts to needs and desires of the four imaginary bodies. To avoid recreating inscriptions of coherent archetypes in domestic spaces, the process begins with gathering of disjointed parts and organs. For example, the assemblage of organs for the sex doll body consists of a collection of silicone parts responsive to a variety of fetishes, shown on the left. On the right is the assemblage gathered from videos of social media beauty gurus that range from wig collections to finishes infused with bio-glitter. As the assemblages grow, the collected parts begin to define the program of the spaces they inform. The assemblage of the social media body is aimed at showcasing body modifications in media production, becoming a YouTuber's boudoir. The assemblage of self-care apparatuses and pleasure devices is formalized as a bathroom for the anxious body. The sex doll's assemblage informs the program of a closet for collected organs, a body shop to manipulate the organs, and a bedroom to test the novel anatomies of the dolls. The detected body explores the condition of fuzzy boundaries between interior and exterior through the facade. Recognizing strict spatialization of rooms in a home as a mechanism of control, the arrangement of the home's program becomes an exercise in attempting to dismantle these mechanisms. To muddy the waters of the sterile genetic compositions of Western domesticities, the arrangement of rooms is randomized. The three rooms are connected to proxies and then rearranged along the vertical spine to a degree of randomness possible within the constraints of parametric software. The section to proceed with is then randomly selected from the pool of potential anatomies of the home. The goal of this exercise is to resist the definitive categorization and gendered ideologies that are instilled into the American home, with masculine spaces located in the basement and more feminine and sexually productive spaces located above. The vertical element shared among all the rooms is the anxiety-reducing device turned spiral staircase. In her research into drugless alternatives for treating anxiety, Temple Grandin studies anxious and poorly handled cows. The spiral form of her forcing pen, shown on the right, calms down nervous cows. The staircase follows the formal principles outlined by Grandin. The question of representation of individual rooms becomes a challenge, as they are generated with no singular coherent image in mind. The sanitized abstractions of plants, sections, or elevations have the potential to project complete and coherent images that this project attempts to resist. Therefore, each room will be presented through the eyes of an imaginary visitor, an architectural voyeur, whose movements are mapped on the perspectival plants of the rooms in pink. The first room is the YouTuber's boudoir. In simulating social media bodies of beauty gurus and drag queens, the design of YouTuber's boudoir is an attempt at following Andrew Holder's methodology outlined in Five Points Toward Queer Architecture that aims to create new but relatively familiar images through rearrangement of parts. The four main components of the room shown on this perspective from right to left, the storage space for wigs and makeup, the video equipment area, the boudoir area, and the feature wall and filming backdrop, attempt to decouple from the gendered norms and histories of the boudoir while responding to the desire to establish a following for a professional YouTuber. While establishing the proportions of the room, the commonly used one-third to two-third relationship that migrated from the rulebox of art regimes is replaced with an equally valid system of proportions based on the available resolutions of YouTube's streaming window ranging from 426 by 240 to 3840 by 2160 pixels. The creative operation observed in the beauty tutorials by Trixie Mattel and Grimes recalls Holder's methodology of producing new images that remain familiar and resist categorization. In a step-by-step -step video, Trixie creatively subverts and exaggerates every feature of her face to broadcast the new image of a woman, while Grimes introduces new parts onto her body to alter the image. Similarly, every part and organ transplanted into the boudoir is intensified to generate an image reflective of the aesthetic sensibility of the manufactured digital landscape of social media. Room for the anxious body, the bathroom. 
In the article on bathroom as the most psychosexually charged womb, Colomina and Wigley argue that the ingrained sense of shame toward bathroom appliances that swallowed the disavowed bodily fluids has been mainly ignored within the mainstream architectural discourse, which in itself is a source of anxiety for bodies that face the appliances daily. As a result, the repressed body produced inside the tiny sanitized bathrooms operates in denial of a range of sexual, psychological, and moral economies. In addressing the feelings of shame that the anxious body produces toward the appliances, the abnormal is exposed and celebrated aesthetically. The design of the bathroom is an experiment in transplanting the collected experiences, objects, and rituals of self-care into a spatially open environment. The program and formal expression of the space are divorced from the institutional desire for cleanliness and upkeep of the physical body, and instead respond to the desires for comfort and pleasure manifested in the virtual reality meditation bathtub and plush resting settee area. The ceramic settee from Villa Savoie is transplanted into this bathroom, refinished with plush fabric and equipped with an apparatus that delivers gel injectables on demand, colliding the notions of pleasure and self-care. This video shows a brief experience of the bathroom coming up the stairs. Room for the sex doll body, closet bedroom body shop. The design of the closet bedroom body shop is a continuation of the exploration of spaces that could be intensified and grafted to a generic bedroom, reorganizing the familiar domestic space into an imaginary workshop where creative operations realizing sexual desires could be performed on the silicone bodies of the sex dolls. Starting with the closet, the microcosm of body parts that can be transplanted and reorganized to craft novel desires. Adjacent to the open closet is a gynecological chair attached to a car shop rig that hosts the bodies of the dolls while their parts are being reorganized. The in-between ontology of the body shop area as a formal workshop and a place to craft desires emerges out of the accidental intermixtures of transplanted apparatuses. As the body of the doll is moved around the room, attached to the ceiling-mounted track system, the physical body plays the role of an assistant in the life of the doll. Facade for the detected body One of Andrew Holder's five points toward queer architecture is the idea of an infinite facade that highlights the fallacious character of divisions drawn between the inside and the outside of an urban dwelling. To explore the fuzziness of the boundary between the perceived interior and exterior, the design of the facade begins with harvesting a collection of parts to generate the facade as an extension of the interior space using the same genetic material. This drawing is an initial experiment at collaging the parts and surfaces found inside the bathroom to generate the facade surface. The collection of planes that produce the facade emerges as a direct inversion of interior surfaces in some cases, and as new imaginary assemblages in others. As the intensity of each plane is concentrated within its perimeter, the intersections of the planes become the territories where creatively productive tension emerges. The desire for clean and crisply defined corners is problematized as a symptom of architecture's affinity for images of clarity. Instead, the emerging corner operations are undefined, allowing the planes to negotiate their mergers and penetrations. In an attempt to blur the boundaries of the planes beyond the corners and disorient the planes' histories, the Google's Deep Dream neural network is used to train the algorithm to see the patterns and forms of each plane in the rest of the planes, in a way training the facade to evolve and learn from itself, relinquishing the initial composition. This training distances the facade's formal operations from the initial scheme that is a project of subjectivity. The ascription of agency to the parts of the facade brought about by the algorithm generates new images that otherwise would be unimaginable to the subjective process while remaining familiar in the context of this facade. The entirety of the training process is documented in this video. And while the video goes on, I would like to conclude. The presented speculative project of a home with its three rooms and a partial facade is of course incomplete, as is the scope of the projected and imaginary bodies that constitute a contemporary human. However, in its specificity, the project aims to address the ongoing fast redesign of our bodies and ways for architecture to keep up. Thank you. Hi. Okay, well, thank you very much, Kate, um, for thank the you. presentation. Um, what I'd like to do now is invite questions, if there are any, for clarification. 
Um, and I'll start with our guests, Julie and uh, Jacqueline. Um, maybe if you could just explain a little bit about the program, your uh, graduate thesis program, like, is it a, a, a full year or a full semester? Um, full, the, the thesis is a full year. Okay. So the, the program is a two year program, uh, five consecutive semesters. The first two semesters are studio and seminars. And then the, um, the thesis is a three semester uh, um, single piece of uh, research and design research. Okay, great. Um, there's a lot, there... there's a lot yeah. to, <laughs> there's a lot to talk we about just, here, right? Well, we can right have in. a discussion, right? Jump yeah. Right in. Yeah. yeah. I guess I'm wondering, um, it seems that the visual senses are highly overwhelmed. And even though I understood the point of not trying to establish a hierarchy, it does seem like every space is the same because it is there's one dominant color and then there's a lot of objects. And even though there's an intention behind what it's supposed to be doing, um, what was the purpose behind differentiating the feelings? I guess it seems that the bottom floor is supposed to be more erotic and sexual. The, the bathroom is supposed to be uh, anxiety reducing. And then the top floor is about showing the self. So I'm just wondering if uh, what how how what was the intention behind uh, making the language similar instead of addressing what that actually does for the senses? Mm -hmm. um, yes, the spaces uh, are visually similar, and there there is um, a bit of a language that was established at the end. Um, the way I approached each space is um, starting with the ideas of senses, which I was calling bodies, and assembling objects and surfaces and um, parts and um, all kinds of objects essentially to populate these spaces. And um, what we usually do uh, in a design process when we choose, let's say, a feature wall or a surface that will join our design scheme, we um, alter it, we change it to fit in with, within the overall idea that we have, whether it's aesthetic or formal or programmatic. And in this case, what I was trying to do is to uh, first sort of let, let the objects be themselves and the color themes that emerged uh, as a result were a result of me processing each object and making them um, either a bright color or uh, giving it personality. And at the end, the language emerged from um, the expression of each object as opposed to uh, me predetermining the language, if that makes sense. And, and how did, what was the intentionality behind the color? Or is it meant to be read as more diagrammatic where the color doesn't really matter, but it's more the operations that are happening within? Yeah, the color was in a way, it was an exploration for me um, to move away from the good taste palette that we usually uh, um, are constrained by in practice. Uh, as architects, we uh, I find often go to you know concrete wood stone um all white rendered fully rendered sleek surfaces and i wanted to move away from that and experiment with um you know having bold colors and textures that sort of fit in with the idea of the social media aesthetic the anxious body aesthetic and sort of combining that into this visual language I hope that answers the question. I was just curious. <laughs> I, I, I understand the question um, and I have a similar question. Um, uh, but first of all, I just want to say that um, it's a super accomplished thesis and the amount of um, research and writing and 
um, thinking through all of your citations um, is super commendable. So I think you did a great job there. Um, I guess like the big question is similar to Julie's question is that you, you land on a certain aesthetic, um, but what was uh, like, I was trying to find the moment where you would um, sort of formulate what the thesis is, is, you know, if it was to, you know, make a case for the aesthetics that you landed on. So, and if that is the kind of um, goal, right, of all of, of thinking about the bodies in different ways, um, then I guess what I would say is like, there, there might be a gap somewhere between part two and part three, mm -hmm. where you start to take part two and describe ways in which you are um, formulating certain materialities, certain colors, um, and, and why those things then get applied to a kind of conceptual idea um, about those bodies. And so I guess that, that moment was, a, uh, was missing for mm -hmm. me in understanding your thesis. But I'm, I, I think you should maybe talk about that. Like, it, like what would you say is the kind of, I mean, you, you talked about indeterminacy, um, partiality, um, making a case for that kind of architecture, but it, it's very broad, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I understand your uh, comment. I, I, we've had a few discussions on the role that aesthetics play um, in this. And obviously it is a statement <laughs> in itself. And um, it was a process. Um, the thesis didn't start as an aesthetic thesis, but somewhere halfway through, I think it became an aesthetic thesis. And um, so sort of a little bit processing that, but um, for me, the beginning, and I think that's why I structured the presentation with the, um, maybe I can pull up the images uh, if that helps. Um, is it okay if I share the screen? Uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, Mike. Um, so I was, I started the, the, where you see the aesthetic sort of, um, emerging, the language emerging is in the sex doll body experiments and experiments with domestic spaces that, um, the idea is that, uh, sort of starting with spaces that we so used to experiencing that are, we see in our condos, we see in our, um, family homes. Um, spaces that are stripped down of sort of bold expressions because we usually don't see them there and sort of intensifying those spaces. So deliberately overexposing uh, surfaces, deliberately adding color and sort of experimenting with that to let's say conform or satisfy the uh, wants and desires of the sex doll aesthetic. So that's where it started. And from these experiments with the uh, bedroom closet and uh, car shop, I think the language started to emerge. Uh, but I agree that um, maybe there, there is a way to explain that continuity a bit better. And um, the role of aesthetic um, expression in this thesis is, it's, yeah, it's something that I need to explain a bit better. <laughs> I totally agree. I, one question that uh, that you and I haven't talked about, but maybe we should have, but that, that just kind of intrigued me from early on, Kate, mm -hmm. was that early in your uh, discussion, you talk about the um, specificity of the male body as used in architectural discourse and traditional architectural discourse. 
Uh, and then later on in the project, the well, that sets up an, uh, an expectation that there's going to be a discussion of gender somehow happening through the project. Um, and it's hard to, but but you you never kind of come back to it in, a, in an explicit way. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how that fits in? Yeah, uh, I see. So the discussion of the male body as the model for human experience that we resort to uh, often in design, um, there are several ways to tackle it. The uh, feminist discourse goes about it, um, sort of says, let, let's explore other bodies. What about all the other bodies? Let's look at them and include them into the conversation. Um, However, the critique of that is that we tend to um, sort of start pinching hauling and doing the same thing that we do with the male body and creating new archetypes. And so we can start saying, let's look at all the other bodies, but um, we can also say, let's not create, not, let's not settle on archetypes. Let's um, sort of put that aside and focus on more productive uh, qualities of human experience that doesn't necessarily talk about gender. So the, the question for me was how to sort of move away from the archetypal, focusing on the archetypal images, which I think male body represents uh, in a way, to focusing on other parts of our personalities that are more productive um, creatively. Okay, now, now to put you on the spot and ask a question that I have no clue of an answer to, uh, how do you link that idea with the um, question of aesthetics that's just been brought up? Yeah, <laughs> I think the, the question of aesthetics in general is so complex. Um, like we tend to, we, we, want to we want explanations, right? When we see consistent language in let's say modernism, we demand explanation. What was it? Was it uh, sanitation paranoia? What was it the desire to reinvent, you know, the um, damaged and traumatized human of that period? We always want explanations and it's, I could come up with it, I could, I think we had this discussion before and Scott was not satisfied with my answer. I could also just say, <laughs> I like this. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's, it's a complex question that has uh, a little bit of me as an author uh, and what I like and what I don't like, but it also has sort of the desire to move away from, uh, like I previously mentioned, only using certain material palettes that we consider a good taste and experiment with something else. Kate, I think, I think that's key. It's not just, it's not just an alternative to, it's, it's, uh, it, it's an intentional uh, repudiation of, right? Like it's, it's, it's not a kind of benign lateral move. <laughs> it's, there, there's something very transgressive about the particular aesthetic. And I think you've, you've got to own that. You've got to be clear about that because it is, you know, you, at some point in the presentation, when you were um, talking about the bathroom, I think you used the word prohibited, mm -hmm. something about prohibit, prohibited. Um, and there's something about that in, in, in this aesthetic, right? Like you, you've kind of, and you've said it yourself by saying you, you've kind of transgressed good taste. So there, there, is, a, there is a kind of, um, the word I'm looking for here. I mean, other than other than kind of transgressive, I'm not sure what the word is. But but there's def there's definitely something here that pushes pushes our our comfort zone, right? I mean, it's a th there's a it's not just an alternative aesthetic; it's a very jarring one. Um, and so that in itself, I think, is an interesting thing to to kind of unpack a bit. That you know, why why would you see this as this this particular aesthetic as outside the bounds of good taste? What is it about it? Like what? how do we def start to define that? Because I think we can, we can agree that, that's, that it's doing that, but, but how is it doing that? What, what is it about it that, that is transgressive? 
or to flip the question around is, I think is to ask the question, what is the disciplinary role of taste? Mm. Yeah, yeah, Scott, and, and uh, I think that the, the term disciplinary in that question has multiple meanings, mm -hmm. right? It's yeah. both, what, what is the role of taste in relation to the discipline of architecture, but also how does taste apply a sort of discipline? You know, of course, with reference to Foucault. Right. Um, Kate, when I, when I received the PDF, I went straight to the end mm -hmm. first to see the project, um, to see if I could sort of just by looking at the imagery to see if I can sort of determine like what your thesis might be about. And, you know, the things that, um, maybe if you wanna scroll to the images that show facade, um, you know, there was, there was this notion that this might be a project about um, a kind of ad hocism in the domestic um, realm, which is mm -hmm. pretty common. I mean, which is, you know, an interesting way to investigate materials and color and aesthetics, especially in, in a home, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think in your presentation, um, when you link each of these rooms to a, sp a particular text, um, it became really like hyper personal, I thought, that it became super personal to your own subjectivity, to your own um, way of unpacking the text and visualizing the text you were referring to. Um, but when you when I look at this image, I'm I'm it's so provocative in the way different materials come together in the repetition of tectonics that are being shown. Um, and so there's something that I think that you're maybe touching on, which is not just aesthetics, but it's in the kind of role of the medium with which you were working through. Um, you were working with scanning. Um, you were also working with um, um, uh, kind of AI, right? Um, and I think that, that was super interesting to me that although it, you know, your thesis is super, I think very personal to you um, in the way you thought through it, you were using mediums that are very, um, the antithesis of that, right? So, um, so I think there's something really interesting there in how you produce this work. And as a thesis, I mean, I think for you to, you know, graduate and keep on thinking about this, I think, you know, you can continue to work through ways of thinking through these mediums that take very subjective and um, specific conceptual ideas to materialize them in some way. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad you picked up on the notion of subjectivity because that's, I grappled with it throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's subjectivity is very interesting to me and how we produce, how, how design works in general. It is extremely subjective. And I think subjectivity can be a root of a lot of evils you know, that mm -hmm. we grapple with as world. But it's, it's very hard to get away from it. And no matter how many layers of uh, algorithms and software you put between yourself and your final product, um, it still <laughs> ends up being subjective and personal. Yeah. And it's, it's very interesting um, looking back at the process um throughout the year it's it's very interesting how it, we can run away from it <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
Um, so yeah, that's something very interesting, yeah. I think, to, uh, that I will keep with me. You know, we, we started the project a year ago, not quite a year ago, um, with the question of, um, you know, how do we, how do we see the body today? Right? How do we understand the body? Um, coming from a, some of the traditional ways of understanding the body, at least from architectural position, to ask, you know, how do we see it today? And Kate's answer, I think, was pretty, it seemed really quick to me, but also right on, which is that we understand it through our technologies, right? We, we see the body through the things that let us see, right? Which is what, uh, what pushed you immediately into all of that, uh, all of those various media, which, you know, uh, it's kind of incontrovertible. You know, you're, you're absolutely right. That's how we see the body is through, through scanning systems and through detection systems and through YouTube videos. And the whole project also looks like a set design instead of like an, a poetry of spaces. And I was just wondering what, what was the reason behind having um, the, the walls that move versus the spaces that are relatively empty and just have these objects in the space? Like why not have those two interface with each other or even move through time um, what was the reason behind that? that that's a very interesting question. And um, um, just processing. <laughs> um, I, I think from the beginning, the spaces themselves did not start as volumes, right? And um, the whole set design notion was sort of rooted in uh, the social media explorations that I did uh, early on with those um, images that I collected, um, let's look at, for example, um, and this whole idea that when a lot sort of subjectivity is a little bit um, disturbed in the process, like in the, um, when, when people post uh, pictures of the works of architecture on social media. The one, the idea of one view and one um, experience being prioritized and collectively selected was very interesting to me. Um, so for, I went through um, a lot of famous uh, projects and in every case when downloading hundreds and hundreds of photos and running them through uh, image recognition software, there would be one point of you that would be prioritized. And I sort of tried to experiment with that and um, the actual um, images of the project in the end sort of follow that logic that there's always one prioritized view and everything else is um, sort of discarded. And that is reminiscent of set design. I think you're absolutely right. And even the way, the way I built them was in a way um, like it, um, for experiments, <laughs> for exploration of these bodies. Um, they have a little bit of volumetric qualities to them, um, but I, I think the whole idea that a set is incomplete and um, to me, completing the space and closing it would be, um, would go against sort of the idea of partiality and incompleteness. So I, I guess that's why parts of these rooms are just not um, not enclosed like like a set would be. I, I would say that maybe they should be more unenclosed. Like they should mm. they they then would fold out even more um, to resist the kind of you know the pop-up Instagrammable view, but to produce um, produce a set, right? Mm -hmm. Where if 
if we imagined it as a kind of pop-up set um, that not everyone, not that there wouldn't be a single photo that is um, matchable. Like the example that you show, like the images are almost matching, right? Mm -hmm. Which creates that fuzziness. But um, to, to maybe think about being a kind of anti um, Instagrammable image, you would probably try to create a set where you could never re ever really reproduce the same photograph. Mm -hmm. That there would be too many, too many things folding over um, upon each other. You wouldn't have a ceiling and a ground and a wall, but those things might be more fluid um, in a way that would challenge the way a photograph is taken. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that, I was gonna say that like, I thought that um, you know, the delivery of your project was pretty conventional. Like you show images, you show a plan, you show uh, kind of axon view models. Um, but really I think like in thinking about your thesis, uh, something more narrative, um, animated, um, like the moments where we see the project moving a little bit um, and you're taking us through the space um, were the strongest moments, I think, in your project. Yeah, I agree. I started experimenting with videos. Um, mm -hmm. Like for instance, uh, this one, which was also processed through Deep Dream, um, and maybe every space should have like a few of these. Uh, I like this view. <laughs> <laughs> but these, to, these to me seem like um, maybe because I'm seeing it with lag. There's a lag on my mm -hmm. end, so they they come up as almost like a stop motion animation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like that on your end but yeah um, so it becomes like these like photographs right mm -hmm. to me on my end so if these were these instagrammed photos each one is different right like you yeah. would never be able to sort of capture the same image twice yeah no i think it's a great question of not only even in real works of architecture what can help resist that um, mm -hmm. Because it, it is a new way that experience works of architecture. I've experienced work works of architecture on Instagram that I've never seen before, but I already have a preconceived idea of what they are because of the collective reproduction. Um, so that's, I think that's a very interesting question. Then did you visit that same architecture and understand that there's a different, <laughs> completely different dimension that you're missing by yes. only seeing the visual? So Yes, but I... I, I'm still drawn to that one spot to take my image of the view that's popular. And I'm, I, I caught myself doing that um, recently and I wondered why. Like I've been conditioned by looking at this um, image in, you know, reproduced multiple times. It's, yeah, of course there's way more uh, to all of these projects. I'd like to come back just for a second to this idea of the of the set, um, mm -hmm. which to me suggests that you're you're kind of talking about the space of domesticity as a space of performance or spectacle. And I wonder if you can maybe talk a bit about that in in your thesis. I think absolutely. Yeah, per, the per, even though I don't explicitly uh, speak to the performative idea of performativity. Um, I think every room is a set for the specific body to play out their lives in a way uh, and play out um, that specific uh, play written for that one body in a way. And that's supported by um, the fact that the space is, there wasn't, there's no party for each space. There's no coherent idea. It is the, 
life of that specific body that informs the space and all the objects that are needed um, for that play to play out. If it makes, mm -hmm. if it makes sense. <laughs> And, and why didn't you tackle the kitchen? Because that could have been an interesting one uh, where yeah. you challenged, um, I, even the body shop could have been challenged with more feminine influence, but. Um, I, um, I, 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 I have an image. <laughs> I tried, uh, I started experimenting with the kitchen. Um, however, I think the other three rooms uh, showed more promise I guess in in my mind and I focused on them but um that's the one I started playing with the kitchen and the idea of artificial uteruses Kate you're gonna have to, gonna have to unshare and reshare to, for us to see that image yeah oh I'm sorry I'm sorry, this just disappeared the whole thing. <laughs> it's just a glitch, a glitch, one of the glitches of Zoom. Yeah, this this is this is a nightmare. Um, yes. I'm sure. There we go. So let's see if that works. I still see this. There we go. Mm -hmm. And now we see the hedgehog. There we go. Oh, I see. It's, uh, my apologies. Um, now this should work. Yes. Right. Oh, right. Right. Yes. Oh, I, I started playing with the kitchen, but I think um, due to time constraints and uh, the, the three other rooms I feel like needed more attention but the kitchen was supposed to be a place where artificial modes of production and reproduction take place um, but I that that sort of um, didn't make the cut <laughs> <laughs> was, was this was this connected to any one of the four specific bodies yeah it was a body on its own uh there were quite a few bodies got cut i think mm -hmm. colin in our early discussions there were six <laughs> yeah about that yeah and and then can i ask I, a question about yeah. like, the role of i mean there's clearly feminism clearly has a role in, in your thinking in this project but i'm i'm wondering to what degree is this project feminist and um, to what degree is it more transsexual? Mm -hmm. I, so when we define feminism, do, I can't really speak to the sort of mainstream ideas of feminism. I don't know if I can sort of support them, but I, what I was basing my ideas on was a post-structuralist feminism. So works of Donna Haraway, um, how, uh, the cyborg, um, cyborgian ideas, that's sort of what was, that, that was my foundation. And um, the ideas of, uh, uh, you know, gender not really uh, needing to be defined certainly play into uh, Scott what you're talking about and I think um, I take I took a lot of inspiration from uh, artistry of drag queens I think for the uh, youtubers boudoir uh, because it's it's not only uh, because the, the, there's um, there's a need for inclusivity because of feminist ideas it's just because it's creatively productive and amazing and I think uh, whatever I can I could get my inspiration from it didn't really matter um, if, if yeah, I, guess, I guess what I'm thinking you know I mean I find this I mean, your work is fascinating and it, it it's, um, goes many places but it seems to me that 
the it's you know feminism seems to be the um, the lever into this idea that um, of gender binary is just evaporating, and that this kind of multiplicitous middle becomes the territory um, of, among which um, these ideas of gender and masculinity and femininity and asexuality, et cetera, um, can freely float. And, uh, and so I sort of see this architecture as a kind of um, floating architecture. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I, I think binaries, not only gender binaries, binaries in general are extremely problematic and when we look in between, there's so much more uh, creatively productive work um, that we can find. Um, so take any binary, not just gender binaries and even interior and exterior, um, mm -hmm. right? So. Mm -hmm. so that interior exterior also is interesting to me that, I mean, you, you, you sort of put, to lose to work with the body without organs. And I think that the sex doll is a great example of a body without organs, that the value of the sex doll is it's all facade and no interior. Although I now that I'm saying that, I'm, I can just see myself being completely wrong. And then I look at your architecture and um, your architecture has got a very complex skin, um, but it also has a very, it has a lot of organs, let's just say. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think of that? I stopped trying to understand uh, the practice of body without organs. <laughs> the, yeah. the deeper you go into it, the more complex it becomes. It's no, I, I don't understand it as an idea any longer. I think it's a practice. Um, and there are many interpretations. There's, you, yeah. I, I, I want to come, to, I want to come to your, to your assistance a little bit there. Yeah. Okay, and it's just to, to, uh, to um, I, you know, when Deleuze talks about uh, body without organs at, at some point late in his career, I don't remember exactly where this is, but he says, you know, it was, it was never intended to be a difference between uh, the, the body and the organ or the idea that there was a, a body that didn't have organs, but rather it was the idea of a body that is disorganized. Right, a body that is not organized, and I, so I think, yeah. So it's it's the hierarchy, it's the it's the parti that's missing, if you like. So I think, in that sense, that's exactly what Kate has been trying to do here: is to produce, a, a, well, and whether it actually does that or whether there's still a lot of organization left is, you know, something we could talk about, but. But at least the organizing schemes are of a different variety than, than we would have seen. So um, I'm afraid we need to bring this to a conclusion. Um, but before we do, I would like to invite uh, each of you, the uh, guests and committee members, if you have a, a concluding statement or comment you'd like to make. And same with you, Kate, if there's anything you want to wrap up with. But, We'll, we'll save you for last, Kate. We'll, uh, we'll invite our guests and then our committee members if they have anything they'd like to, uh, to conclude with. Um, uh, first, congratulations on the great amount of research you've done and um, the beautiful presentation drawings. Um, I do, I don't know, but I, I sense that um, uh, Maybe you, maybe you're timid about what exactly you want to say about architecture, um, but I think this is a perfect start to that um, journey, and to just not be afraid to continue to push those boundaries and to articulate those ideas because there is a lot of this that the world needs more of, and just finding a way to merge. Um, these curiosities and these intentionalities and practicing that it's going to come, it's going to be easier and easier um, to express that. And um, 
I just, it's, it's a lot that you've done and congratulations. Congratulations. I probably um, have asked enough questions for you to think about, um, yeah. but maybe one more thing to think about. Um, you know, I think this um, idea or the maybe the impulse to produce an architecture that is um, beautiful, aesthetic, but at the same time produces some sort of um, fragmented view of itself um, seems to have been your maybe end end goal and thinking through it through the body is super, super interesting and productive. So I would say continue with that thinking. Um, but I think the bigger question is like why, and it's a question that I've seen come up a lot, you know, um, um, you know, how to produce an architecture that is indeterminate and partial where where we read it as something that is not fully conclusive in some way at least visually um, and so I think there's something um, um, it's I think it's it's something to be thought about and determined why and whether or not really um, you know like how, how do we produce a kind of um, visual literacy to understand that, um, I think is super interesting. And I think it's, it's definitely, your project definitely hits on it. Thank you. Scott? Yeah, I'm just gonna, I mean, I don't have any specific comments because we've been working together for a couple of years now. And I just wanted to say, um, like congratulations on this work. It's uh, been thrilling for me to be um, a part of and um, a, a real, to be honest, a real privilege. I have learned more from this work than I've learned um, from a lot of um, things. And um, it's been a really valuable experience for me. So I can hardly wait to see where this work goes in the future. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Before I invite Colin, a supervisor, to have the last word from the committee, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, we've talked a lot about the outcome, you know, the, this this kind of extraordinary uh, body of, of of work as represented primarily through your drawings. But I also just wanted to compliment you on the uh, theoretical and intellectual sophistication of of the whole thesis, all the research, and at every step of the way, every milestone was some kind of really powerful kind of revelation. Um, and I think uh, it's pretty clear that, you know, you've, you've learned a tremendous amount from this process. Um, and that's all we can ask for. It's not so much seeing the outcome, which is fabulous and incredibly provocative, but just the, the level at which you pushed yourself. Um, I just really want to congratulate and commend you for that. Yeah. And uh, Colin, if you'd like to <laughs> conclude. Well, um, I just want to say exactly the same things. Like this has been an, uh, an amazing process. Um, Kate, you know, I've rarely had a student working with me who needed me less, <laughs> right? Which is amazing. And every time you came to see me, there was something new that actually made me see something differently, right? That made me understand the technology differently or made me understand to lose differently or made me understand something or, or holder or, you know, something about, uh, about sexuality or something. And that's great. So you should be very, very pleased with what you've accomplished and with what you will accomplish. Thank you and so that's much. It. <laughs> thank you so much and thank you to Jacqueline and Julie you guys gave me so many insightful comments and made me think about my work differently that I I wouldn't think uh, uh, otherwise thank you so much to Scott, Mark and Colin you, this has been an amazing experience and I'm just 
I'm ready to collapse from exhaustion, but. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now you um, can. You can go yeah. right to bed. <laughs> yeah. Nowhere else to go. Yeah. But, yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Well, okay, congratulations. So it was really a joy to see it. And I, I echo what Colin said. I, I learned a lot just from looking, um, reading through your thesis as well. Thank you. So again, thank you very much, Kate. And unfortunately, now we have to ask you to leave so that we can continue our conversation without you. And after we're done, um, Colin will be in touch with you. And I guess you guys can sort that out. But normally what we yep. do is you'll just start a new, a separate private Zoom meeting. Um, and Colin can fill you in on our, our conversation. Okay, yep. sounds good. Thank you, thank you um, very much. Leaving now. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Kate. All right. Thank you, Kate. Thank you.